Dear friends, again, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome once again to the opening of the Texas Annual Conference. During this last year, it's been exciting and heartwarming for me to hear so many stories of ministry from our congregations. You are an amazing group of people doing amazing things. Thank you for your love of Christ and your love of the United Methodist Church. Last year, I invited you to join me in praying for the wild and wonderful, upside-down turning, life-changing, movement-birthing, institution-reforming Holy Spirit to come among us and our churches to change us, reform us, make us new. I invited you to embrace God's dream of a new church, a church characterized by vibrant missional congregations that transform their communities in the love of Christ. I invited you to imagine spirit-led laity and pastors who could create and innovate new ways to meet the challenges of our day in the same spirit that the early Methodists met the challenges of their day. And last year, you voted to establish these three areas of focus as our four-year focus. And therefore, at each of the next annual conferences, we'll be taking an in-depth look at each of these. And this year, as you might have already suspected, our focus is invest in the young. What if we were to invest in the young. And when I say invest, I don't just mean sh shifting budgets. I mean investing our ideas, our time to build relationships, our energy to reach out to the young people who are all around us in our own communities and even in our own families. Now look around this room and imagine what if all of the resources and the vitality and the energy of the people in this room, the power of the people in this room, could be invested in changing lives and reshaping futures. Now, what if you were to expand that vision to everyone in your congregation? That makes us up to just under 300,000 people. And think about how those connections or networks multiply almost everything. Investing. The story of the relationship between God and God's people is a story of God's investment in us, in people, and in creation itself. Walk with me for a minute. It begins in a garden. God formed Adam, a human being, out of dirt, out of nothing, and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. The human being came alive. And then God's investing continued on a boat. God saw that human evil was out of control, but there was one person that God trusted. God said to Noah, I'm starting over with you. Build a boat and get on board. And he did. God invested in Abraham and Sarah. I will make your descendants as many as the stars. And then when God's people were slaves in Egypt, God invested in a, motor, in a leader named Moses. God sent a pillar of fire, a cloud of smoke to guide the people of Israel in the wilderness. God supplied food and water. And finally, God gave the Ten Commandments to reshape their understanding of life together. A pretty major investment on God's part, don't you think? And as the years went by, God sent leader after leader, Samuel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and many, many more to warn, to comfort, to remind the people who God called them to be. And then, and then God made the biggest investment of all, God's own self. For three years, Jesus invested in people through his teaching, through his preaching, through his healing, through his confrontations with evil, and finally through giving his own life. 
For a while, it seemed that evil had triumphed, but God wasn't finished. God raised Jesus from the dead and God poured himself into the world again when God sent the wild and wonderful Holy Spirit to turn things upside down, to birth a new movement, and to be a continuing presence to the people of God. So my friends, I want to ask you just one question here at the beginning. Into what cause are you pouring yourself? Where are you pouring out the power of the Holy Spirit that God gives you? Is it something comfortable but maybe isn't working too well any longer? Or is that invest in the future? Are you pouring yourself into a dream big enough to be worthy of God's dream? As one of our pastors likes to put it, what are you going to do with your one and only wonderful life? Today, our generation, as with all generations, is being invited to invest in God's future. And one of the most significant investments that we can make is in the young. The young. Babies, children, youth, young adults. There was a time when continuity and stability described the world and the church. It went on for many years. And in those times, people rightly valued experience and maturity as the very highest priorities. However, in times of transition and change, creativity, innovation, risk-taking are vital. And it's young people who are often keenly perceptive about what needs to be done, and they're bold enough to think they can do it. Transition and change describe our world today. Deep global trends such as digital communication, global interconnectedness, urbanization, increasing diversity are changing all our lives. Virtually all of our institutions, education, government, healthcare, employment, religious institutions, they're all struggling to adapt. And nowhere is that change more obvious than right where we sit today. Houston is the epicenter. It's the heart of these changes. Only 30 years ago, take a look, this was downtown Houston. A few tall buildings and a lot of open spaces. Houston and all of Texas now has been blessed with growth and now we are a modern city with skyscrapers all around us. Our entrepreneurial spirit and can-do attitude have taken us in a hundred new directions. We've rightly been called the most global city in the United States, well over a hundred languages now spoken in our public schools, and believe it or not, we have more Sikhs than Episcopalians in this town, and the youngest average age of any major city in America, which is one of the reasons, I might add, why immigration reform is so critical for all of us. It's that, it's that spirit that has led Texas to be a leader in the new age of technology. Technology is used in every facet of our life now. Facebook. Facebook is only eight years old. Did you know that more people are signed into Facebook than are members of the Catholic Church, which is 2,000 years old? And going viral, it has a whole new meaning. <laughs> Some of our religious institutions are banking on dramatically new approaches to meet these challenges. For example, the Houston Austin Episcopal Diocese just sold all of its hospitals and now has the financial resources to create a whole new faith-based approach to the enormous health care needs in our state. We'll see what happens. Friends, those same deep trends are reshaping the United Methodist Church as well. Just walk with me
for a quick overview of what's happened in the last 12 months in the United Methodist Church since last we met. Let's start in July, right after annual conference. When the Texas annual conference discontinued our old newspaper format for cross-connection, we went electronic. We used to print 3,943 copies, and we never knew how many people opened them. Today, we email 13,000 cross-connections with an average open rate of 61%, and we know every issue. If every local church were to share the email addresses of their members with the conference, we would be emailing well over 200,000. In September, Lon Morris, once a crown jewel in the Texas Annual Conference, closed, declared bankruptcy, and left numerous creditors unpaid, including a million dollar debt to this annual conference. The rise of community colleges, the cost of higher education, and many, many other changes simply couldn't be overcome by spending more money and trying harder. But what if, what if Methodists were to take this ending and others as an opportunity for fresh thinking about old questions? What would it look like going forward for Methodists to transmit a rich Christian Methodist culture to youth and young adults? What if Methodists were to anticipate such changes and decide to turn today's assets into a resource for the future rather than a liability to be carried by the next generation? In January of this year, we learned that St. Paul's Methodist Seminary, one of only two United Methodist seminaries in our jurisdiction, now has fewer than 35 students. It's selling its main campus downtown in Kansas City, Missouri, and they're moving out to Church of the Resurrection. They have decided to make a bold move to invest in a congregation-based seminary education rather than an academy-based seminary education. Will it work? Is, will it be effective? Did they act quickly enough to have the financial and leadership strength to be able to make the change? We don't know any of that yet, but it's an experiment worth watching. Just a month ago, April 30th, the United Methodist Publishing House closed the last of the Cokesbury retail stores, including the one here in Houston. They said, customers just aren't coming to retail stores anymore. We shop online. We don't buy as many physical books. Last week, we learned that the United Methodist Reporter is closing. Once again, the result of change in how people want to get their information and read the news. It's a new age in communication. People now read on their iPads and Kindles. So what does that mean? Just imagine, what does that mean for local churches teaching third graders on Sunday morning? What does it mean for public schools? Our two-year-old grandson Zachary already knows how to turn on my iPhone and find the Disney app that he likes. Grandmother, he will say, I want Mickey Mouse. How will his parents and his Sunday school teachers excite his imagination and all the other two-year-olds out there with the biblical witness? Here in the Texas Annual Conference this year, the retirement tsunami poured on our beaches. A record number of retirements, 26 this year. Um, a few years ago, the economic downturn of 2008 slowed it down, but it didn't stop the inevitable. Those retirements, along with other transitions, resulted in over 175 appointment changes since January. That means that nearly 25% of our congregations will experience a change in pastoral leadership, and this wave isn't over yet. Within the next 10 years, 50% will, of our clergy will be reaching retirement age. So how do we face this reality 
with creativity and plan well to assure the future of our church and our communities.